Hello, welcome everybody. The webinar I think is now live, so we've started recording, um, but we'll just give it a minute to get started. Hey, Andrew, greetings to you too and any Australian colleagues. So, Alex, do you want to um, begin with the housekeeping? And we just got a few details just to explain a little bit about the plenary and to introduce the panelists, and then um, we'll get going. We have a Mentimeter for you to, to learn a bit about yourselves. Um, and then, obviously, this is, I think we can give it quite a free-form discussion. Any questions you want to, to ask to learn about the plenaries and, and why to join? Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Welcome to the second webinar on RDA Virtual Plenary 17 and why you should join us virtually in April. And um, like Sarah said, so um, a few housekeeping points before we begin. This webinar is now being recorded and the recording will be available on the Research State Alliance YouTube channel later this week. You're encouraged to ask questions on the Mentimeter poll that will soon appear on your screen or by raising your hands and using the Q&A box um, on your Zoom interface. So I will now um, introduce our panelists and chair for, for this session. So Sarah Jones, our chair, EOSC Engagement Manager at Jayant, RDA Virtual Plenary 17 Program Committee member, member and member of the RDA Technical Advisory Board. Our first panelist today is Rachel Bruce, Head of Open Science at UK Research and Innovation, one of the hosting organizations alongside um, DCC and JISC and member of the RDA P17 Programme Committee. We have Helen Gleaves, Senior Data Scientist at the British Geological Survey and RDA Technical Advisory Board member. Mervyn Olluing, PhD candidate in Data Science and Analytics at University College Cork, joining us today as an RDA Early Career Researcher. Hugh Shanahan, Professor at the Department of Computer Science at the Royal Holloway University of London, uh, Co-Chair of the CodeData RDA Research Data Science Schools Interest Group. And last but not least, Robert Quick, Associate Director at Science Gateways Research Center at Indiana University and member of the RDA Technical Advisory Board. So if you can now go to menti.com and use the code 5673, Two five five, so we can get, um, so we can see who we have with us in the audience. And I will quickly switch to this presentation. And let's see, what country are you joining us from? Italy, Netherlands. Well, we know it's not only Europeans. So see how long it takes Andrew to type Australia. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there he goes. And the US as well. I think this is one of the benefits of RDA that it is very much a global organization. We have people from all around the world who join the plenaries. And the UK, people staying up late for the webinar. Is that us? Should we move on? Uh, maybe give it another minute or so. I don't know if other people, um, Yasser, Kathy, I'm not sure if they've responded to the mentee just yet. There might be some other countries. Saudi Arabia as well. It must be very early morning for you. So thank you very much for getting up and joining us.
Okay, I think we else? might go with lucky seven and move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. So, are you an RDA member? Okay, most people okay. yes, one no. Hopefully, we can maybe convert you in the in the webinar today. Explain some of the benefits of joining. Should we move on? And we've increased in number as well. Nine of us now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yep. By all means, move on. Have you attended an RDA plenary before? Yeah, again, most people haven't been to plenaries. So we have two plenaries a year, um, and that's the main event for RDA. That's where all of our interest groups and working groups get together and do their work. So it's a good opportunity to learn what's going on in different areas of the world and to share expertise. But we'll hear from our panelists on some of the benefits of RDA and what they get from it. And I'm, I'm sure they'll reflect on plenary experiences as well. And how did you hear about the webinar? Via the program committee, social media, mailing lists. Uh -huh. It's good to see people checking the mailing lists and the RDA website. We have lots of ways that we try and push information out, but it's always good to know if there's other places that we should be uh, targeting to, to reach you. Okay, we're probably good to move on. knowledge of RDA did you have coming into the webinar? No knowledge, aware but not engaged, RDA member but not actively engaged, and RDA member and active participant. Mm -hmm. Mostly active participants. Yeah, and you'll hear some of those um, participants on the panel and the kind of things they do in RDA. And for those of you who haven't engaged as much yet, you'll learn about how you can get involved if you're wanting to. There might be um, new topics, for example, that you'd like to join groups and, and be a more active participant. And what are your experiences with other community-based organizations? similar to RDA. <laughs> I like high yeah. bear. <laughs> yeah, highly variable. Yeah. And Kathy, um, could we be more specific on our example on our question here? I guess, Alex, were you wondering about, you know, how they work and if it's like different setups and formations or different ways of contributing? Mm -hmm. How how would people interact with similar um organizations like RDA? How would they what what would their experience be? How would they um engage with it and how would they work? Yeah. Yeah, so from my own perspective, that's one thing I found quite different with RDA, that it's quite easy to get involved in interest groups and working groups. In other fora, I've maybe attended conferences, but it's not been as easy to understand how to get actively involved in the work. Yeah, the other thing I always have thought about RDA, and I know it took quite a long time to get there, as it would with any organisation, naturally, it, you can kind of see the trajectory between the sort of early idea through to something forming and then, you know, an output. And um, I think RDA's worked really hard at that in terms of um, there's almost a whole life cycle of 
how you develop best practice and um, and, and lessons um, collected. Yes. Yeah. And this is something actually for people who are new to the plenary, this is something we try and make clear on the programme. So you can see, obviously, if, if it's a boff, it's um, a new idea because it's a birds or a feather group to solicit um, kind of feedback and see whether there is a group to be formed. Um, but with the interest groups and working groups, you get a sense of what stage they're at, whether they're in that early development cycle or if they're close to outputs um, release or adoption which makes it easier to know kind of where to join or, you know, what kind of contributions are being looked at. Excellent. Um, is there one more question or? Yeah. What do you what expect? <laughs> virtual Kelly. <laughs> I'm hoping to see Alex and Kevin dance. Bit of virtual virtual Kaylee dancing. Give us a Scottish mm -hmm. flavour, even though we sadly can't go to Edinburgh in person. Yeah, yeah, there are promises of that. Yeah. I think there are some apps that could <laughs> yeah. use the service. Could help facilitate it. And it's good that we have people, it's the first time coming to a plenary. We'll also reflect on, you know, virtual as opposed to in-face plenaries um, and give you a sense of what to expect from that. And finally, any questions for the panelists? Yeah, so you can enter your questions on the Mentimeter here. We can leave that open. Um, and also there's a QA and a option in, in Zoom. If you want to put them in there, I can pick them up out of the chat there. What I'd suggest we do then is, is move on to the, the panel itself um, <clears throat> and to find out from the panel what some of their experiences are. So the first question is a very simple one. Um, why would you encourage somebody to attend an RDA plenary? And I know we have several people on the panel who've been to various plenaries. Um, so it'd be good to think about, you know, what your experiences are, what, what lessons you should share and why you think somebody should attend. So I don't know who wants to pick up on the panel first. I don't starting. Oh, right. Helen's going to start. Oh, sorry. Go on, Helen. Yeah, I can start. So uh, yeah, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, so I think from my perspective, one of the, the best things about attending plenaries, certainly from, from, from my experience, has been that I've had the opportunity to perhaps not only um, meet colleagues working in the space that I'm working in, but I've also had the opportunity to diversify a little bit and find out what's happening um, in, in other spaces, as well as um, the normal things that I would gravitate to, because my background is very much in data management, research infrastructures, that kind of thing. Um, but I think RDA is a great place to find out about what other people are doing, and also how that potentially can intersect with what I'm doing and perhaps come up with some new and creative ideas around how I might work with people who I don't normally traditionally work with and also meeting people that I haven't met before as well um, and sharing ideas. It's, it's a very stimulating environment, I think, which is part of the reason that I look forward to RDA plenaries and part of the reason that I'm kind of missing having that physical interaction mm. even though virtual meetings i think bring some different benefits but we can come back to that later so rachel i'll hand back to you being as you were about to contribute i don't think it's much different um but maybe a slightly different perspective but um along the same lines i mean overall i think um you know originally i remember when rda was a, a kind of you know twinkle in people's eyes and it was all about so could you create um, a way to have a sustainable um, research data support and infrastructure environment. Um, and I think that, you know, it really has been successful in doing that. It's a great community. Um, 
a, a community where people are able to share either established practice ideas or develop practice together. Um, and the other thing I think it, that's, you know, really unique actually about the RDA is all of the different groups in terms of, um, for example, research funders um, and um, also representatives even sometimes from, I suppose, more minister ministries um, perspective occasionally as well, um, as well as researchers, data scientists, data stewards, um, as well as infrastructure providers, publishers. Um, and so I think you do get all of those different perspectives that come together. Um, and I would say that in terms of um, the breadth, um, it is, you know, really unique in, in that and, and bringing all of those different stakeholder views um, collectively on a shared important um, issue. Excellent. Thanks, Rachel. Do any of the gents want to uh, wade in with a view on why attend? <laughs> So, so I think I have very similar things to say. It's it's introduction and uh, uh, allows you to meet people who are doing similar work in maybe slightly different areas, but uh, along the same lines and share ideas and, and share uh, uh, concerns of the, the various different communities that we service as uh, infrastructure providers. So I think very much uh, um, it also has allowed me to uh, somewhat expand the uh, uh, purview of what I normally uh, had been looking at for many years. So uh, being a cyber infrastructure person, um, data was always kind of on the sidelines, but in recent years, it's really come to the forefront and seeing where the ideas in um, uh, the people who are specifically uh, looking at data problems it was really, really good from a cyber infrastructure uh, point of view. Excellent. Hugh or Mervyn, do you want to add into that or we can move on to another question? Um, I suspect, I, I think I'm going to, I, I think <laughs> the other three kind of really sort of hit the mark there. So, so yeah, no, I, I think I'm happy to move on if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'd be okay. just repeating things as well. Yeah. So we do have a question in the chat from Andrew Trelaw, which is possibly more for our program committee. So I would invite others to, to speak up about this. How are we planning to accommodate those in non-European time zones as we prepare for plenary 17? It's a very good question, Sarah. Um, and um, I was thinking about it. I, I guess, and look, Alex has turned on her camera. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can I can answer I can start answering this um, question. So we do have international um, time zones on the Friday, the twenty third of April, starting in uh, midnight British time, which will be um, uh, more friendly time zones for people in Australia and in the states, hopefully. Um, and we have three additional breakout sessions um, for um, yeah on the Friday morning. That will hopefully be easier for people to join. Yeah, and I think as people were submitting their session proposals, they were asked if they were willing to run things in multiple time zones. So all those things will be recorded. Hopefully, um, there will actually be some in-person things in more amenable time zones for everybody. Yeah, exactly. We are going to offer the opportunity to people to run their session a second or a third time on the Friday morning as well. So if you've missed something during the week, there are um, there's every chance that you can catch it again on Friday morning. Yeah. I think you know, we'll admit it, it's, it's not going to be equally accessible probably to, to all time zones and it is going to be slightly friendlier to, to, to one part of the world than, than the other. But yeah, we are making an attempt at least to um, uh, yeah, accommodate those certainly uh, in, in Australia and uh, East Asia. Mm. But we recognise that it won't be quite so the, the same experience. And another question that's kind of around the way the plenaries are changing at the moment. Are virtual plenaries inferior? I know some of us have been to some of the virtual plenaries, wondering whether um, we should just wait until we travel again to join RDA. I see Helen shaking her head already. If I so could... I can... Go on, Hugh, yeah. I'll let you go first. Okay, 
So I'm going to say something kind of pragmatic about this, which is, um, you know, uh, going to a virtual pre-re costs less. At least the last mm -hmm. time I, I checked, the bill is 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 a lot less. And indeed, if they were like, um, I know we don't have anybody here from that, but if you have a, you know, somebody's from a low and middle income country, I think it's like twenty five dollars. You know. Yeah. So it's it's if you'd never come to an RDA plenary before, it's it's a really cheap way of sort of seeing what it's like and putting your kind of toes in the water. Now, of course, it does it does feel like a huge bunch of different webinars and stuff like and, and stuff like that. But um, if you're if you're kind of kind of wondering, is this the right thing for me? This is maybe the right actually a virtual training is maybe the right thing to 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 do in that in that respect. Yeah, it's a good way to test things out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I, I would throw in here just a um, um, the issues around data aren't standing still uh, for six months at a time, right? So mm -hmm. um, I, I think the important reason to attend the virtual plenary is that uh, um, uh, your your problems and the problems of researchers surrounding data are not sitting still while while uh, um, we're all locked at home uh, due to travel restrictions um, and. It's important, maybe even more important now, to see what other people are doing um, and uh, really push the uh, um, uh, community as a whole forward in these practices. Um, so I, I think the, the big reason uh, um, to attend, you know, uh, the RDA plenaries during this time is that um, you know you, you may miss the boat if you if you don't. Right, something important could be happening that you could contribute to. Um, and if you wait until the next time we travel, um, right now, that's a, a big question mark, of course. And of course, your career, your um, uh, research, your uh, data problems aren't standing still while, while um, um, we're all under travel restrictions. Yeah. Can I just add something there yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, just from the perspective of an early career researcher, um, it's like, and to echo what you said as well, it's a lot more accessible when it's virtual and um, you can kind of, you can pick the sessions you want to attend and you don't have to attend everything um, because you can watch the videos back later at a time that suits you. Um, I did attend the last one virtually and I, um, I found it very useful. I was able to follow a lot of things and um, I really benefited from it. It's a good way to kind of maintain the links with the RDA as well. Um, one of the things that I've found that I've gained most out of actually was just what you learn, it, learn from it because things are discussed at such a detailed level and um, you just don't get that anywhere else really. And I've also I probably I'm moving beyond the scope of the question, but um, I've yeah I'll probably stop there. I'll probably fill in talk about some more things later, not to be kind of deviating too much from the question. Yeah, no, perfect. Thank you very much. I think I mean from a personal note on me as well. Um, it it there's actually some real perks to the virtual plenary. It's the fact that everything's recorded because often so many things you want to go to are running in parallel, but the, the way the recordings work, it made it very easy to catch up on other sessions. And there were some very nice socials about, you know, cooking or book reading and giving recommendations and, you know, replicating some of that coffee side chat that you would often have at plenaries. And I think that worked very well for networking. So actually, maybe to come back to you, Irvin, about the early career perspective, because I realize this is how you've got engaged in RDA. You know, why do you think early career researchers should attend or are there ways that they can really contribute to the plenaries? Yeah. Um, well, just speaking for me personally, um, it was a real confidence booster in a way, first of all, to be selected as an early career researcher. Um, for somebody who had just started out with his PhD, um, to have somebody go through your application and select it as a as a grant winner was was quite a personal boost for me. Um, to go to the plenary, then I, I because I'm my PhD is in data anyway, I, I would have had an interest in data. Um, 
but I did find that I was amongst ex experts who were quite a few levels above me. And in the beginning, um, I found that I was just sit sitting in at the plenaries and the um, breakout session sessions and a lot of the, the uh, terminology was new to me. But uh, um, I one of the things that best ways of gaining from it actually is to um, to get involved in the sessions. Um, and I think any session you'll go, you'll go to, they're looking for somebody to write notes and report back and things like that. So that's one way to get involved. The other, other ways are like asking a question at meetings. Um, if you want to meet other early career researchers, probably the best way to do that is to get involved in the early career researchers group. They have a social event. Um, I think it's usually, it's, it's the second night. It, um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's usually a good way to kind of break the ice with other, not just with other researchers, because sometimes you'll get a few other members who are, who are not early career level, they'll just come along as well. And you can kind of get to know people. And that's where I've actually found in a way where I was over the hump of the plenary, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, because in the beginning, it is a bit daunting. And then once you kind of know people, it, it just makes that a little bit easier. And then, of course, for the same reason, the, the, the dinner is also a good way to get involved, too. And you kind of meet people and some some of the most meaningful networks and connections that I've made out of the RDA have been just getting involved in the various activities. And um, it's, it's also where I've actually learned the most, too, from getting involved and um, because you kind of there's such a wide variety of things and I, I, I've learned a lot about fair data. I've learned a lot about software code citation and um, I've got involved in organizing different um, ask me anything calls with the early career um, engagement and interest group. And um, it's all been quite good. And I, I have to say, I've always enjoyed my engagement with the RDA and I yeah. highly recommend it to anyone else who's thinking of, participating in that way yeah I think that early career researchers group is a really good one because of this kind of mentor program that you can get feedback from people who are at the plenaries more often they can help help network and introduce you to other people that would be useful contacts oh absolutely I mean 100% it probably is the the single best way for somebody in that category to gain the most out of it getting involved yeah. with those that group Excellent. So to maybe move to some more kind of like personal anecdotes, what's the best or the most memorable thing that's happened at a plenary or the best thing you've got from being a member or being active in RDA? <laughs> okay, I've got a couple of things, Sarah. Shall I go? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Rachel. Go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to. Yeah, okay. So, um, Oh, there's actually quite a few, but so uh, I mentioned two. So yeah. one, I think, um, around journal data policies. Uh, so we happened within our workspace just to be looking at that issue. Um, and two colleagues of mine at the time, Dom Fripp and Linda Norton, were working with publishers and funders um, and her held a boff session. Um, had, I think they were quite nervous and apprehensive actually about the whole thing. And now of course it's an established group um, and is clearly contributing to um, best practice for all different stakeholders and is, you know, the work that comes out of that group is referenced. So I see that as a success really, because we went from, you know, working on that just within our team um, with other people within the UK um, sector. And now you're looking at an international group um, and you're seeing groups such as STM publishers and, and others um, referring to the outputs. And, and that's helping to create hopefully um, standards which make things better and easier um, for, for everybody. So that's one of the um, successes I feel has come through. Um, and then just a kind of uh, memorable thing, and I might get the plenary wrong, but <laughs> I think it was the plenary in Japan, 
where um, the panel was all men. And I think Simon Hodson called it a manal. Mm. <laughs> uh, Twitter storm. Um, and, but it did mean we really paid attention to those issues. And um, I think Hillary as well held um, a session and it was, it was quite a discussion within, within that. Um, and then two months following that, I was in Brussels at a meeting on similar topics and the panel was entirely women bar barren moms. <laughs> 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 so I do think that, that that discussion, whilst it was fairly awkward at the time, I think it, you know. Yeah, it's an important one to have. To make people think. Excellent. Thank you very much. Kevin, I see you flicked camera on. Would you like to come in on this question too? Yeah, I mean, it, in some ways, I think it, it's not dissimilar from the first of um, Rachel's anecdotes, actually, from the very first RDA plenary. Um, where we, at that very first plenary, clearly um, there weren't existing working groups. And a lot of what was going on there was people in much more informal sessions trying to get other people behind an idea to say, wouldn't it be good to work together on this? Um, and we joined one session um, where we realised people were talking about something that we've been developing in the DCC. We were just about to launch, I remember, the, the scientific metadata catalogue. And we, we were quite proud of doing this, but we had these real worries about how we were going to maintain this over time. We knew it was going to take a lot of effort and we knew we didn't have the resource to do that. And we hadn't really answered that question. And that group turned out to be the ideal thing. There was a bunch of people saying, we ought to do something like this. And we were able to say, well, we kind of have, but we'd really like to work with other people to, to, to continue that. Um, and I think it's the best of successes really is that in a sense we've been able to let that go we're still contributing mm -hmm. in some way to, to keeping that going but that group took that work so much further than we could have done uh, uh, alone um, and and it was exactly what I wanted to get out of an organization like RDA to be able to easily find that that more global community of people to, to take something that you care about and run with it and turn it into something much better than you could have done yourselves mm, yeah nice example and the kind of dream uh, response to put on the sustainability when you're reporting on something like that. Sarah, can Excellent. I just, just jump in on that? Because I, I just wanted to, to perhaps just add a little bit to what, to what Kevin said, because I think that's a really important strength of RDA. I, I've been involved with a couple of interest groups throughout the, my career with the RDA, which has started off right from the first plenary and um, I've been involved with both the active, active data management planning group. Um, I was one of the initiators of that group and also the virtual research environments group. And, and I'd really like to sort of echo what Kevin said. It's been a real, um, I, I found it very rewarding actually to have been part of the group of people who set up those groups, but they've evolved in a way that I certainly couldn't have imagined when we started those groups and has taken you know, concepts and thinking forward, but has also brought together a diversity of people that I don't think would have happened in any, any other mm -hmm. space in, other than RDA in the way that it did. And, and it's been great to see how both of those groups have evolved since I was part of those groups. And it's nice to be a member, but no longer a co-chair so still be contributing, but not necessarily leading. And I think that's a really rewarding part of being, you know, one of those people who, who's involved with RDA quite a lot and um, a regular attendee at plenaries. I think that's one of the really rewarding aspects of, of RDA. Yeah, actually, we've had similar things on the co-data data science score. It's, it's really rewarding to see you know, new people coming up through the ranks who've either, you know, been students yeah. on the course and then have taken on as coaches. I don't know if one of you wants to reflect on that, Hugh or Rob. Yeah, oh, oh, don't, we don't want to turn this into a whole series of Code Data RDA anecdotes, but yeah, I mean, I think in particular, um, you know, looking like, uh, you know, as um, uh, Marcella, our fellow Car Cordoba, who attended one of our schools and then you know, became an instructor and then became a, a chair. And uh, 
and and basically was was the whole powerhouse behind the the Costa Rica school Costa Rica plenary even if it didn't actually physically happen like suddenly you know she kind of was like this like absolutely key individual which was there so it's absolutely fantastic to sort of see you know and it's it's, it's an enormous privilege to to chance to, to 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 work with her going 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 forward that's just kind of one example um i suppose in terms of 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 anecdotes i don't think i've got anything as controversial as as <laughs> as, as as rachel has or anything like that um i'll be completely flippant and say um yeah music is always really good there's perhaps some of the most clearest memories it's like the first rda in dublin there was fantastic music there and oh, um, I yeah, for that. yeah 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 and what yeah. and botswana just you know a botswana was like <laughs> whoa we're here and you know that was like you know a, an amazing moment and then the last kind of physical one in 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 Helsinki, um, yeah, the brass the, band, <laughs> yeah, the brass band, the 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 plenary dinner was was fantastic. Um, kind of okay. I better try and you know stop being so you know flippant and actually think about something which is a little bit more relevant. I actually think about the first Dublin one, and and funny enough, it was actually that was I'd been going to I'd been to two before that. I was a little bit like, uh, what am I doing? And that was the first one where I kind of felt like things were clicking. And, and funny enough, it was it was actually kind of going out for dinner with with a few people, you know, uh, a, a thing. And, and that was the moment thinking back about that evening was like we didn't really talk about the schools, but that was the moment when things started clicking and kind of understanding people and knowing where they're coming from and and and, and so on. So you shouldn't ever mistake there's a there's a kind of high social content in there and you mm. should never kind of mistake that for saying oh, this is trivial actually it's it's it, it it it's really useful and also understand that these things take time to kind of get to know people and and know what they're 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 doing i think as well yeah definitely and so let, let me answer from two directions and, and continue on with, with uh, what he was saying. So, so I'll answer from kind of a career uh, professional uh, side. And, and really RDA has allowed me uh, through a few interest groups that I've been associated to go from collaborating on grant proposals to leading grant proposals. Um, now, you know, in the, in the uh, um, you know, somewhere less than a million dollars, but not too much less than a million. I've led grant proposals for my institution. So there's a real uh, payback both for myself professionally, but for also for the institution that uh, I'm a part of, Indiana University. Um, and I think RDA and the ideas there really took me from uh, um, contributing and, um, and being part of other people's proposals to taking ideas uh, away from a group and taking them out to outside funding agencies and getting them funded. So, uh, um, and in fact, there's, I'm, I'm submitting another one later this month that will triple all of the money I've uh, brought in so far. Uh, so it's a pretty large one and it surrounds again, the, the uh, uh, data fabric interest group and a lot of work that's done in um, uh, uh, persistent identifiers and, and, uh, mm -hmm. And such. So, um, and that's that's kind of so professionally. I think uh, um, what I've gotten out of RDA is you know a, a chance to uh, uh, step up my game a little bit and uh, talk to some I talk through some ideas with people who are very much in the know uh, in several of these issues and refine them to a point that uh, to move you know to move the career forward. Now, on a more personal level, I think that I've made. Um, some lifelong friendships and and even some of them with people on this call uh, uh, who are talking to you also. So I think there, there's uh, uh, people that I talk to on this call outside of um, outside of work on various different things and and can uh, um, you know so I, I think there, there's also that social component. Um, the question is again how to recreate that in a virtual environment mm -hmm. because I don't know that that would have happened in a completely in virtual environment. But um, uh, that that's something for uh, <laughs> for uh, uh, virtual uh, conferences to figure out, and I don't know if they they will. However, um, I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of things to get both on a professional and a personal level from uh, networking with 
uh, somewhat like-minded people, or even people that aren't <clears throat> like-minded, uh, the, the disagreements uh, take you quite far too. So, mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. Can I add yeah, something there? Of course. Um, just um, actually, it's just something Robert said um, that made me think of it. Um, I some things that I've taken from the plenaries um, I've been directly able to use in my job. And again, I'm speaking as an early career researcher. Uh, for example, I've given presentations on fair data. I remember also in the um, Philadelphia plenary, there was a, quite an interesting presentation given by Professor Sajanovic, um on bias and data. And I just found as well that, that I use that as a backdrop for another presentation because I do find that at least in Ireland that a lot of the public sector anyway is catching up with all the a whole idea of open data and um, making it findable, having permanent identifiers. I mean, UCC has only actually started to look for the DOIs now with any publication that you you've had. So all of these things have actually, you know, in some way or another are related to the work that is being done by the RDA. And the fact then that I would have had some knowledge then that I've, that is, uh, I've gleaned directly from the plenaries has kind of put me in a position then where, um, even though I'm an early career researcher myself, I would be almost an educator to some of my colleagues in my job. And um, I've really found it quite beneficial in that way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of knowledge you can learn at the plenaries and that can be very helpful with your with your work, as you say. I notice there's a few things coming in the chat about the um, virtual interaction and, you know, how much people are missing physical plenaries, going and meeting with colleagues, having that social chat, the dinner, the pinball games or drinks. Um, and uh, Kevin and others are asking, you know, there's still time to influence this for um, the P17 in Edinburgh. Um, so at Costa Rica, we did have some interesting things, some book clubs and cooking, kind of sharing best recipes. Um, if people have ideas about things that work well in a virtual context, um, by all means, do share them because there's something we can take into the plenary. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> a, games, a game off, it's a den where we can put all the geeks. <laughs> yeah. So we're coming um, towards a close. I've just got a couple more questions that are really kind of practical things. So um, we did have some people who you know, are new to RDA who haven't engaged that much yet, um, or it will be their first plenary. And I wondered if any of you have tips for navigating both RDA itself as an organization, the kind of all the working groups and interest groups, because I think that can be quite overwhelming to identify what it is you should go and go and connect with. Um, but also the plenary itself, how to break the ice, how to engage and connect. Any top tips from your experiences there, Helen? Yeah, so Sarah, this is this is more a general observation actually from um participating in a number of virtual events. Um, and I think one of the tips that I'd like to share with people is make sure that you block out your calendar in your mm -hmm. online diary to indicate that you are attending the RDA plenary because um, maybe this is just me, but people around me or who I work with seem to think that um, my diary is fair game, even though I've indicated that I'm attending the RDA plenary. So do make sure that you know, you treat it as though it's any other work activity and block out that time because otherwise you'll find those meetings start backing up and you, you struggle to actually get to those really interesting looking sessions that you planned on joining. Um, so I think that that would be sort of my top tip, um, largely because I found that quite challenging so far in this new virtual world we're trying to navigate. Yes, yeah, no, I've had exactly the same. I think it's really important to imagine you are at a physical event and you are away because if you weren't in the office, people wouldn't be trying to put things in your diary. But I think in this virtual world, everyone just thinks, oh, you have the coffee break, you have some time free, but that's time you want to connect. I mean, the other thing which is obviously deliberately programmed and always has been in the RDA is that there are introductory sessions to sort of introduce people to the RDA so you can um, 
get orientated, um, which are always helpful. So, I mean, if I was a newcomer, then I would definitely be making time for that and blocking it out in my diary. As Helen yeah. Said. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, there is always an introduction for newcomer session. Um, there are also um, meetings for chairs. So if you're like a new chair of a group, you can learn about um, how to chair groups as well. Um, and some of the uh, kind of RDA intel. Um, and as Mervyn mentioned earlier on, there is this early career engagement group and they do a social event as well. So that's a good way if you're fairly new to, to meet a few other people. And the, the other thing for early career researchers as well is just don't be shy. Um, mm -hmm. It can be difficult. It can be daunting. I, I know I've been there myself, but, um, you know, just, I mean, I, I think you'll, while I've said all that, I think you'll realize pretty quickly that most of the attendees are also introverts. So, you know, they're going to understand that you're going to have, like, it's a bit daunting as well. And they've been there as well. So just, just, and don't you don't have to push yourself too hard into anything but whatever you're comfortable with just try and get involved and put yourself forward that's the only advice i can give there yeah and, and i'll say two things here one one i will uh get to andrew's question but my strategy at least in the face-to-face -face plenaries and and it i think it would work in virtual plenaries also is i usually don't try to engage the the speakers of a session, I try to engage the people who ask interesting questions because they're not, you know, uh, usually after the session, the, the speaker is, um, uh, there's a line to talk to them. And, uh, but, but if somebody asks a question that I think is really uh, quite interesting, then I find those people are um, very good to engage with. If, if they have a question similar to something I would have asked, then um, they're, they're in the same space as I am regarding a, a subject. So, um, that, that helps me, one, avoid the line uh, to uh, the people and, and overwhelm them after they've just had, you know, a, a presentation, but also uh, is usually quite enlightening. Um, mm. And um, so, so secondly, that, that, that's just kind of a personal strategy that may or may not work or may be worth attempting as you go to a plenary. Um, the second thing is, as Andrew brought up in the chat, the plenary pathways. So uh, the, the tab works on these pathways that are kind of uh, a grouping together of similar sessions within the plenary. Um, these, uh, I, I'm looking at the list from P16, for an example, this part brought together a pathway of the FAIR agenda, which would be sessions uh, um, that we're dealing with FAIR uh, in various things. We had a, a specific COVID-19 one in, at P16, uh, as uh, that was a, a very much a concern, and there were very uh, there were, I think, five or six interest groups all looking at COVID. Um, the data lifecycle was one, research software, uh, data management. So, so this is kind of a pathway to get you an idea if you have a overall subject that you're looking at, which sessions uh, deal with that. Um, and I'll also say, so I'm going to say one more thing and, and then mm -hmm. stop talking. Uh, I'll go back to what Hugh said earlier in that um, it took me a few RDAs before I really got the concept and, and was able to go from being an observer to being involved. Um, I, I went to a few and then uh, was in Tokyo at the at that pl uh, that plenary and that's when I really said, hey, there's some things I can dig into here and, and really get involved with some groups. So, um, and, and that was after attending either two or three prior to that where it did seem somewhat, you know, confusing and there was a lot of going on and there was a lot of searching for um, uh, what uh, was in my interest in a lot of the sessions, you know, uh, sounded like one thing to me from my background that that ended up being quite different. So it does take mm -hmm. time. And, and in fact, it would have been quite nice to have a few virtual plenaries where I didn't have to have the, uh, the expense and travel overhead before going to a in person uh, plenary to try to sort some of those things before, um, before, you know, having the the overhead, not only financial, but time overhead of a in person plenary. Yeah. I, one last thing, uh, just to kind of about the blocking out of time. I think there's there's a kind of a corollary to that, which is if you're in a time zone where, you know, you're up you're up at 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 a at a, at a strange hour. Um, try not to be you know the super person and give yourself a break, you know, during the daytime and just 
because you know you're just you, you yeah well you know maybe if you're 20 something yeah you're, you're you know you're good but just give yourself a break is this thing <laughs> <laughs> don't try to work all hours yeah yes. there's only so long you can burn the candle at both ends yeah hey Rick, can i add something yeah okay. of course Oh, thanks. Uh, well, because I think um, Rob just spoke about the plenary pathways. And once the program is out, it's useful to spend a little bit of time to go through the program with the pathways. Uh, the program is color coded as well, to uh, so people can understand. So birds of a feather are new groups starting up. Uh, interest groups and working groups have different, if, if you like, they're at different stages of their life cycle. Um, and then there are some really interesting joint uh, meetings as well, where groups uh, all co come together to discuss a topic that could be overlapping. So I think um, I think we had something like 81, 81 sessions mm -hmm. will be run or 80 ish sessions. So that's quite a lot uh, that the valuable part is, like everyone said, the recordings are will be made available. If you register, you have access to them as soon as they're made available. But some time to understand which are the most you know, important ones, I would suggest that you do that. And I just confirmed that, yes, we will be running um, the RDA for newcomers. I think we're doing two or three different time zones. And we also, uh, members of the Secretariat will be available every day at Ask Me Anything sessions, which people can drop in and out of if they want to know something about RDA or find somebody or whatever. So we didn't do that in the previous ones, but we want to... Uh, offer that during this one so we'll see if that works. Excellent thank you very much Hilary. Okay is there anything else anyone would like to reflect on? I, we didn't have that many questions from the floor so I don't know if any of the attendees want to ask a final question about the upcoming plenary or if Kevin wants to do a sales pitch on why you should come to Edinburgh and some of the benefits we're going to have there. The virtual Kaylee is hopefully something we will achieve, or at least some Scottish music to make you feel like you're in in Scotland. We'll do our best. Yeah, I'm not going to try the sales pitch. I think that's really what we've been been mm -hmm. trying to do for the past hour, and uh, I couldn't add anything to anyone else. Excellent. I'll just I add get some that. whiskey. Yeah. Sarah, I will just add that I do think that. Um, the, the two keynotes on, you know, should be really mm -hmm. great. And um, so the, um, why have I, why has my mind gone blank? My mind's gone blank, Sarah. <laughs> I can remember Richard Gould from McGill University, who's doing the uh, keynote on the 22nd. Um, and that is a really interesting, I think, um, perspective. So, um, it's entitled, you know, Early Drugs Discovery, and that's because um, McGill University has worked with um, the Montreal Neurological Institute and the Structural Genomics Consortium. And it is amazing when you look at this kind of open science and the way in which you can work with the commercial sector um, and uh, the research sector to to make a real difference but also what is really great is Richard has done loads of analysis about the practices around open research and also as part of that is really about you know how you share and reward data um, and how you really practice to make sure that you get real impact so I think I'm hopeful that he will be able to give you know quite an exciting um mm review of those and from his perspective because he's actually an IP um, specialist um, so he's he's kind of been involved from a slightly different angle and perspective than those yeah. we've had before. Great and I think that should tie in well with the panel which is also about data reuse and some of the benefits and impact of reusing data in different contexts. Excellent. Well, a huge thank you to all the panellists for reflecting on their experiences with RDA and also to you for attending. I think there's a lot to look forward to um, with P17. I'm just going to close. I forgot to get this prepared just with a couple of links. So let me just go to share screen. I have the Mentimeter open. Click that one to present.
that will go big screen. So the registration is now open. So um, by all means, um, take a look, make sure you get the early bird rate so you get a better price for the plenary. But as was mentioned before, um, we do have special rates for people in lower and middle income countries as well. The submission deadline is also still open for posters. So if you have some work you want to share and profile, why not present a poster? You can still put that in up until the 26th of March. So there's a few weeks left on that. Um, and for the few of you who weren't already RDA members, it's very easy to become a member of the organization. Um, and that also helps you then when you're trying to navigate the different interest groups and working groups, because you can join those, make sure you get all of their notifications. So thank you very much for attending and thanks to those for staying up late or for getting up very early in the morning and uh, look forward to seeing you at the virtual plenary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. Bye.